and I would like to introduce Professor. And then he was postdoctoral fellow at Yale University. From 73, he was a research staff in MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. From uh, 86 to 2000, uh, he was joint head of Division of Structural Studies. From 95 to 96, Deputy Director. And from 86 to 2006, Director. And from 2006, Program Leader. He also has many awards, um, such as Honorary Member and Fellow of British Biophysical Society, Microscopy Society of America, and also received several prizes, such as Gregory Aminov Prize for Crystallography from Royal Swedish Academy. Thank you very much. Nigel, we had lots of great fun over the years. And thanks also to the, uh, the Good Gajones Committee for uh, choosing us to have this award, following uh, John, John Ez himself, Archie Howie and Mike Whelan, uh, John Steeds and Michi Yoshi Tanaka, who are the earlier, more material science oriented, more convergent beam electron refraction, so proper theory. We are, by contrast, fairly sort of amateur electron diffractionist since we're just doing simple electron diffraction um, and then going on to do imaging. So today I'd just like to tell you uh, two, two, th two stories. One a little bit about how I got involved. I never intended to become an electron microscopist. Um, I was a, 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 an enthusiastic e uh, diffraction, X-ray diffraction uh, trainee initially, but then I gradually realized that uh, electrons were powerful for smaller crystals and then imaging probably gives you, in that it gives you phases, gives you more power than diffraction. So I'm just going to show you a few slides from the past and then tell you a bit about what we're interested in at the moment. So this is, a, this is when I started as a PhD student, um, there were only two or three protein structures known. The first one being from the work of, um, let me just get this, this, from the work of, of John Kendrew on, on myoglobin alongside Max Brutz on hemoglobin. And this was the very first structure in 1959, published in this, this particular picture is from Scientific American in 1962. And now, of course, there are 130,000 uh, protein structure coordinates, not all unique, uh, deposited. So this is this has been an immensely successful method. Um, and my involvement was initially working on um, alpha chymotrypsin with David Blow. So naturally, the power of all these spots, analyzing the Fourier components, finding the structure, was uh, a very uh, attractive method for this. Um, so um, later on, um, with uh, a visit to Yale as a postdoc, I went to a meeting in San Francisco uh, the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, and Walter Stachinius um, here gave his very first talk about his discovery of this uh, two-dimensional crystalline patch in the helobacterial membrane. And I think that was his, the first talk he ever gave, and I thought this was the, the most exciting talk at the whole meeting, because here was uh, an interesting membrane protein whose function at that time wasn't known, and it was already in the form of 2D crystals. So presumably it would be very much more easy to make 3D crystals if you already had uh, two of the dimensions that existed in, in naturally. Um, so um, after a year or two after this, uh, other people had been working on it, but um, I, I felt they were sort of heading in the wrong direction. So then uh, we started to work on it and isolated these membranes, which according to the Stachinius procedure, and this is what a drop of them looks like on it. This is a carbon film, and these are the membranes, all the same shape as they were in the bacteria, but now uh, they are sort of 99% pure of, of, of a crystal of one thing. So then um, I went back to uh, LMB in Cambridge, and after about uh, two or three months, um, we had an annual seminar series and Nigel was speaking then about his phase plates and his TMV and the uh, structural changes in the, in, the, in the negative stain and so on. And it was clear that Nigel was thinking about the images that were taken in the electron microscope 
being images of the protein with the stain simply surrounding it as a sort of sarcophagus, preserving the protein structure. So we got together and spent about 18 months or two years uh, working on these 2D crystals of bacteria dopsin. And the top left shows an electron diffraction of one of those native patches, exactly the same size, one micron diameter from the bacteria. Uh, the bottom slide on the left was the one that Nigel showed, which is an optical diffraction pattern of these very low dose images, showing you the same spots. But of course, by analysis of the images, you can get the phases as well. And that gave this map. Um, so then, um, That was the 3D model that Nigel also showed you. And here is an electron diffraction pattern. So we went on and made the, this is a much better diffraction pattern than the, these original ones because we recrystallized the membranes and made them much bigger. You could even get them a millimeter in size, but still one molecule thick. And so these diffraction patterns go way out beyond two angstroms here. So in principle then, we knew that uh, the structure could be analyzed, just like we knew from X-ray diffraction patterns. You just have to get the phases. And we tried many wet methods over the years um, to get a f high resolution phases for these structures. And this, these were the, and actually in the end, it was about 15 years from 1975 till 1990 until we had a map good enough to interpret. We tried uh, multiple crystal forms. We had an orthorhombic form that Hartmut Mikkel made. We tried molecular replacement where you average the structure, cycle the phases around. Michael Rossman did that. Uh, this was a map that Joyce Baldwin made in 1984. And indeed, there is a peak here, which turned out later to be the ion or beta ion ring of the retinal. But we never believed that. So this was an unpublished map. And then eventually, having tried uh, heavy atom derivatives, which was Tom Seska's work, model building and refinement with seven tr uh, helices trying to get phases from the model. David Agar did that. And then this. Um, molecular replacement that Joyce Baldwin and I, we eventually decided that none of these methods were powerful enough and we would have to do high resolution imaging, which we'd try to avoid. Uh, when I was working with Nigel, I thought uh, I would be happy to learn electron diffraction following on from X-ray diffraction, but really the imaging was just too difficult and that should be left for Nigel to do. Um, but by about 1984, we'd, we'd concluded in this, in this structure that we had to do imaging. And so we set about learning imaging and it was the work of Hua Chu who went to Berlin using a liquid helium microscope on crotoxin and showing that you could get an image with a diffraction spot from the image on film at 3.9 angstrom. That was the, the point at which I was sort of pushed over the, the barrier in, from diffraction, electron diffraction, was the only thing we did prior to about 1984 in, over into the, to the imaging. And then, then with collaborations with Ken Downing, uh, with Fritz Semlin, and uh, some imaging at home, we eventually got uh, a better map in 1989, nearly good enough, and eventually in 1990, this map on the right, which we were able to take the amino acid sequence, which had then been done by both Ovchinikov and uh, uh, Karana, and fit into it uh, more or less the whole sequence, and you can see some of this is a tryptophan side chain, tyrosine side chain, phenylalanine side chain, reasonably well resolved, not so good resolution vertically because we were limited in our tilt angle. But that was um, essentially uh, how we went over a 15 year period from a really nice low resolution model to a reasonably good uh, high resolution model into which a, a map could be built. Um, Lots of other good work was done by electron diffraction on bacteriodopsin over the next 10 years. For example, Nico Grigoriev came and joined us from 1993 to 1998 and did some excellent uh, refinement of coordinates into the electron diffraction data that we had. Uh, and in fact, I think his electron scattering form factors, which were refined empirically, are probably still better than the ones everyone is using in their maps that come out of the international tables, which are from non-bonded atoms. And Nico also did dynamical scattering analysis and diffuse scattering uh, correcting for that. Those gave only small improvements. And then Sriram Subramanian came for, in the end, a three-year sabbatical. And we did lots of intermediate trappling, got a structural change, and so on. And so then about uh, 
the year 2000, I think we stopped doing electron diffraction and switched to doing electron imaging. And the person who, of course, people had been doing single particle EM uh, prior to that, I certainly had followed Joachim Frank and Marin Van Heel's pioneering work with, with negatively stained work, particularly on ribosomes. But it was Jacques Dubochet's work in the early 1980s. He'd been hired by John Kendrew at EMBL to develop a deeper understanding of, of how rapidly frozen ice behaves with the view to looking at structures unstained in ice in their sort of native environment. And these were, this is Jacques, uh, a year or two ago. Uh, obviously, he was much younger in 1982 or so. And this is a review, a 100-page review he wrote in Quarterly Reviews of Biophysics, 1988. And these were the two apparatuses that he developed. One is a gravity-fed uh, little electron microscope grid with thin film of liquid dropped into a little bath of, of ethane at the temperature of liquid nitrogen, rapidly freezing it and creating amorphous ice. Or he had these spring-loaded, uh, elastic band-powered uh, plunge freezer. Um, and of course, now you, you buy for 50,000 pounds or dollars, you buy a more sophisticated computer-controlled uh, plunge freezer. But often, they are less reliable than, than Jacques' one. So um, alongside the work uh, of, of Dubochet and all the people who followed there, um, Another thing that was important in, uh, in at least my uh, change of emphasis was um, a meeting that I was asked to go to in Grenoble by Carl Brandain and um, Andrew Miller, where a whole group of people wanted to build an X-ray microscope. And these are very good for, for big specimens, not very high resolution. Um, and um, at this meeting, it became clear that many people didn't realize that although electrons had a much higher cross-section and appear to do much more damage, the amount of damage they do per useful elastically scattered event, which could be used in your electron diffraction or in your imaging, was much less by about a factor of a thousand. So I ended up writing this review and having written it with the main purpose of saying electrons were a really good thing to use in imaging and diffraction, compared to neutrons and x-rays, at the end of it, I thought, well, maybe we should calculate really what we should expect to do in the best situation after you've solved all the other problems. And we had this table, which apologies to those in the audience who've seen it before, but the idea was to calculate for big structures and little structures, not now in the form of crystals, but as single particles, although the theory was calculated with pretending it was a crystal. And then to calculate, can you find uh, the molecules against the background of high noise from the electron dose. Uh, and, and the idea was you could, you could see them if they were above about 5 or 10 kilodaltons, and you could find them and distinguish one orientation from the other if they were above about 30 or 40 kilodaltons. And then we said in the, at that point, you probably needed about 10,000 single particle images to average it to get over the radiation damage. We now think that number is a bit less. Um, so then uh, we sort of switched. Um, our emphasis from uh, doing electron diffraction and making 2D crystals, and the 2D crystals were often not, as, not well ordered, just like you find with 3D crystals, so we switched our emphasis to single particles. And these are uh, two or three examples of typical images now. This is uh, pyruvate, pyruvate dehydrogenase that Sriram uh, talked about yesterday, one and a half um, megadaltons, and you can see all the different views, five-folds, two-folds, three-folds. This is mitochondrial complex one that I'll show a little bit later. Uh, Vinoth Kumar and Judy Hurst had worked on 900 kilodaltons. You can see all the different views against the background of amorphous ice. Um, the next one is catalase, 240 kilodaltons. The ice has been blotted in the middle. It's thin. The molecules are squeezed back. These are all in one orientation and then multiple orientations and then overlapped. And then finally, when you go to very small structures, this was ovalbumin, 40 kilodaltons, they look more or less like little black dots. Bigger dots if they're bigger, smaller dots if they're smaller. So this uh, gives you a kind of intuitive feeling against that kind of hand-waving, uh, idealized theoretical calculation. So then um, the other thing I wanted to... Uh, to bring out is that 
the way we think about this analysis of, of single particle EM, um, and there, there are two particular new types of plot. They're not ours, but other people have been doing them that we're using that we think are quite informative. And, and you need, we need to look at this initially just to find out about the background. So the, the idea here is that this is uh, essentially a Wilson plot from um, Wilson's and Wilson's statistics. The idea is that a particular structure, a single particle in ice, will diffract and have a certain average structure factor with resolution or resolution squared. And eventually, at low resolution, you have a lot of strong diffraction from the particle and the structure and so on. But beyond about 10 angstroms, all the atoms you can think of as being more or less randomly oriented. And this is uh, essentially Wilson statistics. Square root of n is the number of atoms adding randomly. And then they fade slightly according to the form factor. But then we have an image, and the image is blurry for one reason or another. And so there's a, a, a more rapid fading of the diffraction patterns. And then in the computer, when you're identifying these particles and orienting them, there's another blurring factor from the lack of accuracy of determination of position and orientation and so on. So the, the signal from these average particles is fading. And meanwhile, there is noise in the image from the five or 10 electrons per square angstrom dose. And so if you work it out, and that was in that theory, the noise from one image, if you took multiple images of one structure, it would be very high and you'd only get 20 or 30 angstrom resolution. But then you average different structures and each time you, you multiply by 10, the signal to noise goes up by the square root of 10. So the, the noise level is coming down as you average and eventually you have enough that you've determined the Fourier components of the structure. And if it's blurry, you have to have more. And eventually, when the signal equals the noise, you have a resolution limit here. And then the other thing I wanted to point out is that if you have 100,000 particles and you get a certain resolution, uh, and then you back off and do another map with fewer particles, 10,000, you will get this resolution, and then, and so on. So you can, you can make a plot that is equivalent to this Wilson statistics and this temperature factor fading of the, of the structure uh, in, a, in a different way that I'll come to in a moment. But this was the theory. Here is the experiment. This was the same pyruvate dehydrogenase. The red curve is the experimental data fading. This is the constant part where there's noise. So the resolution in this case was about here, was about nine angstrom resolution in 2003 with a temperature factor, classical B factor, the eyewaller factor of 1,000. And, and then you, you couldn't get to higher resolution except with astronomical numbers of particles in those days. And then, of course, the methods have, have improved subsequently. So now we have this new type of plot. And I don't think it has a name, but I've, I have seen uh, Joachim Frank doing them. And the one that convinced me this was a very useful plot was a recent paper by Radiston Daneff uh, from Martinsried in Germany. Uh, just earlier this year, of uh, the proteasome being plotted where you have the number of particles versus the resolution squared. And if you refer back to the previous Wilson statistic plot, essentially what you're doing is changing the noise level by changing the number of particles, and that gives you a certain different resolution. And if it's a straight line, that basically says that more or less one fading factor, one Gaussian, one B factor, is describing a whole clutch of all the things that are wrong with your data. And, and so it's, a, it's over a very long, over something like seven natural log units, at pretty much a straight line. With a, and, and then it turns out the slope is uh, one over square angstroms on the bottom, and it's a, a, a number, a natural logarithm. So the slope it dimensions is square angstroms, but you have to multiply by, by two to get the B factor. And then here are a couple of other structures that Vinoth Kumar, who's now in Bangalore, uh, worked out recently in collaboration with uh, two Indian groups, dimethylformamide and uh, uh, hydrolase and a phenylacetic acid uh, enzyme. And all of these three and many others, if you work it out how many particles they were using, it's a few thousand, but if you back off and look at about uh, 10 angstrom resolution, um, then they are using about 800, 1,000, something like that. So very much in tune with, with that theory. So I think this type of plot uh, is something that would be very good if everybody was doing in the future, because it tells you a lot about how well you're doing compared to, uh, compared to the theory. 
Okay, so um, one more example is this uh, mitochondrial complex one that I showed earlier. Vinoth Kumar with Jai Penju and Judy Hurst collected uh, initially data that went to about five angstrom resolution showing 76 transmembrane helices, uh, eight iron sulfur complexes. Uh, this was a structure that very much Leo Sasanoff had worked on in terms of thermophilic bacteria, but now um, with a, a, a lipid disk around it and with higher resolution data, both uh, Judy Hurst, Vinoth, and uh, Shai Penju, and Leo Sasanoff in bovine and sheep have now got maps at around 3.9 or 4.2 angstroms in which they've been able to assign all 46 of the polypeptide subunits, um, the blue ones being the core subunits that are also present in the bacteria and the red ones being the supernumerary ones that are present in, in mitochondria. So that's just one example. Um, and then going back in time um, to show how much improvement has been made in cryo-EM of single particles recently, uh, the bottom are the two structures at five angstroms and 4.2 that I just talked about. But back in 1998, Nico Grigoriev, freshly after writing the program Freeline, had done a similar study of the same structure at sort of 50, 40, and 22 angstroms. And so the big change from 22 to 4 angstroms has come from improvements in the program, improvements in the imaging, improvement in the detector, improvements in the microscopes, and so on. So we've, had, we've been on a very rapid gradient of, of change since then. Okay, two more, two more things. This is the second plot that I think is very useful. Again, I don't think it has a name yet, but it's a basically a plot of information content on the y-axis versus the electron dose in different frames of the movies that are collected with these new direct electron detectors, which take a picture every fraction of a second, and then the typical exposure is from adding together either 50 or 5,000, depending on whether it's integrating or counting detector. And this is four different structures. That's the complex one that I showed you from Vinoth Kumar's work. This was beta-galactosidase, an early data set that we collected. These are two ribosome data sets from Shar Sherez and Venki Ramakrishnan's work. And they're, they're different types of plots. So the, 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 the top two and the bottom left one are plots from data that's output by Shar Sherez's Relyon program, where he has uh, worked out the structure and then looked at substructures from each individual frame scaling them with a, a scale factor and a, and a temperature factor, B factor. So the, he is plotting then B factor against the frame number. And what you find is at the beginning, the images are very blurry and very bad, and then they get better, and then you get radiation damage and it fades. And then in this bottom right one, we're plotting a Fourier shell correlation for the seven angstrom data. So that's showing you that even at seven angstroms, data, you've got less than half of the power in the very first frame. Then you have this plateau, and then you have the radiation damage. So this type of plot uh, is, uh, is very informative about what's happening. What should happen, of course, is the first image, like electron diffraction, should be fantastic. And this should be a straight line coming down uh, from a high intercept on the first frame, linearly down if it's on a log plot, and B would be a, a log plot. So this is, um, I'd just like to finish with this picture, which is from some work that uh, Chris Russo and I have been doing recently to try to uh, dissect what it is about the data in these images that is causing uh, the uh, information being extracted from the different movie frames in the image to be less than perfect. And the idea is that if all the problems are fixed, perfect detectors, no beam-induced motions, but radiation damage being your main limitation, then you would get this uh, fading of the information content according to the red dotted line there, uh, which would be radiation damage. And we don't exactly know the slope of this line yet, but we're saying that at the moment, our best guess from looking at all the data is that after 25 electrons per square angstrom dose, you've got a B factor of about 150 here. So that's about six square angstroms per electron per square angstrom of, of, of exposure. And then we reckon there are at least four, but four main ones, causes for that to be degraded over what it should be in the perfect situation. And the first little gap between the 
the red dots and the, and the, uh, the blue squares comes from the fact that you put the beam on the specimen, a thin film of ice, water itself is radiation damaged, and the product of bulk water radiation damage is reformed water, but all the water molecules have moved around in the meantime. The ones on the surface turn into gas and ex escape as hydrogen and oxygen gas, but the ones in the middle move around, and after 25 electrons per square angstrom, all the water molecules on average have moved by about five angstroms, and that's from some work uh, with uh, Greg McMullen and, and, and Vinoth Kumar, and that gives you a drop in every image in the entire movie frame, but it, it drops it in a way dependent on how big the structure is. So ribosomes only get moved around by the water molecules by about half an angstrom, whereas a small protein would be moved around more. So the, the, the gap between the top two lines gets bigger as the structure gets smaller, and then you, but you can make up for that with just having a few more uh, images. Then the next uh, gap, which is the thing that we've been working on most recently, we're worried about charging and charge fluctuations, what we call the bee swarm effect, and even people with material science will see this. And then uh, there is initial charging, uh, which we've said is probably over in a fraction of a second, but the big problem is this blue area, which is beam-induced motions, and people are, there are lots of programs now that do their best to correct for the beam-induced motion as you go through the movie, and they do it quite well, but probably not well enough yet, so we need to improve that. So I think uh, the bottom line is that we are moving towards having an understanding of what the problems are, and, and the future is really quite bright. So here's the, the summary then. If we can improve the images, instead of having an average B factor at the moment for the data sets that we've got of 80 or 90, probably the best you can do, because you still need to give it some exposure and there's still radiation damage, will be about 30. And if you, can go, if you go from 90 to 30 at three angstrom resolution, that means to get the same quality of map, you would need about 20 or 30 times less data, less images. And so the, 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 the sort of ultimate dream would be one image of a field of view of a few icosahedral viruses, and then you get the atomic resolution structure. Alternatively, you could do as much work as you do at the moment, and then you'd get a higher resolution. And because it's a threefold, it's root three, so the types of things we need to fix are detectors, uh, phase plates, uh, chromatic aberration correction, beam induced movement, of course. And then there is also the promise that perhaps by going to even lower temperatures, you'll be able to do even better. So I'd like to finish then just by thanking all of the people that I sort of touched on. So we had a lot of uh, people, not all at once, uh, but originally with Nigel, which uh, we heard a little bit about that earlier. And then uh, Tom Seska, Joyce Baldwin, Fritz Semlin, Ken Downing, and so on, all involved with the initial work on bacteriodopsin, and then more uh, of the refinements and the uh, trapping of the intermediates with Nico and Sriram. And then we switched about 1995 to 2000, our emphasis from electron diffraction of crystals into this single particles. And, and both Nico and Sriram were the, uh, and actually um, Jacqueline Milne as well, she was actually the one who first started to do computing in Cambridge on these single particles. And then more recently, uh, Peter Rosenthal, John Rubenstein, and, and Vinod Kumar, who is now in Bangalore, setting up an Indian uh, state-of-the-art facility. And then uh, backing all of this, we had a, quite an effort originally with Wazi Faruqi uh, doing electron diffraction on purple membrane with phosphor fiber optic detectors, but now looking for, up to now and into the future ahead. And then, and then more recently, uh, Chris Russo and I are trying to get to grips with these beam-induced motion problems. So anyway, thank you very much for listening again. Thank you very much, Richard, for this delightful talk. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have time for questions, but I'm sure that both um, a coffee break and they will be happy to answer your question. I would like to ask Richard and Nigel to come here to the stage because the local organizing committee would like to give you some token for um, appreciation for the talks.
Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the local organizing committee, it's my real pleasure to present a token of appreciation to Professor Nigel Anwin and Professor Richard Henderson for their wonderful presentation for this, and also congratulations for these Jones Medal uh, Awards. Also, on behalf of the local organizing committee, it's my real pleasure to present a small token, token of appreciation to Luisa for conducting this session so efficiently. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Session is closed.